Good evening. It's great to see such a, uh, an enthusiastic crowd here uh, filling up this uh, lecture hall for this evening. I want to welcome you uh, to the Melbourne School of Design and welcome you to this very special lecture by Professor B. Joy Jane, Architecture and Law. My name is Donald Bates. I'm the Chair of Architectural Design here at the Melbourne School of Design, University of Melbourne. We'd like to begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri of the Coulomb Nation. And we pay our respects to their elders, their families, past and present. This is a special lecture, and it's brought to you as a collaboration between the M Pavilion, the Australian India Institute, the Wheeler Center, Center, as well as the Melbourne School of Design. It's always a great pleasure to work with colleagues across the university and the broader community here in Melbourne to be able to bring such an engaging and thought-provoking series of events such as tonight's evening lecture. To begin the end evening, we want to start with just a small, just a short video of BJ, B-Joy, Jane, and Naomi Milgram. B-Joy Jane is one of the world's most fascinating and interesting architects. I'd been thinking about an Indian architect for M Pavilion and started to read about the work that he'd been doing with Studio Mumbai over quite a long period of time. And it was fascinating to me that he was working with a model around collaboration so that he had a lot of craftspeople working with him in his studio. Collaboration and what I call creative connectedness is a major part of the Naomi Milgram Foundation agenda. With M Pavilion, we try to bring creative industries together, supporting the exchange of ideas. B. Joy Jane's architecture has been described as ethical, and what that means is that he actually displays an empathy. In practical terms, it's not a technical response, it's an emotional response and more of a way of life. This is what I was very, very attracted to. This year, there was an opportunity for M Pavilion and Melbourne to work with artisans whose know-how is passed on from generation to generation. Just recently, the Australian builders have spent time working with B-Joy in Mumbai, and it's been a fascinating experience for them as well to be working with an architect of B-Joy's calibre. The M Pavilion for me and the hope with the M Pavilion, it's a gathering space. Uh, it's a place for thought, a place to reflect, and the hope is that for the people of Melbourne, it creates a space where they can experience that. I think that for me would be this place where the heart, mind and body are all connected. So I remember I walked uh, the first day with Naomi to the site and, and I think it happened both at the same time. I was thinking about it and Naomi talked about it, this idea of a kind of column free space. For me it was important to connect the idea of ground, sky and earth. And within this, there's also this idea of all the elements of water, light, you know, air. This idea of just making this cross-sectional cut where in some way you locate it to that place, but you also can locate it outside its context. And something that I'm more curious about, that we're all fundamentally connected from the same place. And it's a universal one. In this case with the M Pavilion, this whole idea of the Australian red ochre by just lifting it up, you know, the same mud that you stand on is now on top of your head. What we're doing in this process is making it tangible so that we can physically inhabit the thought. I look at this structure more as an idea of scaffolding, but I'm interested in this idea not of the physical scaffolding, but that it suggests a sort of an idea of the manifold where the structure in some way is communicative of something that one builds on. It's a constructive space, or by that very nature, it is then a creative space. Coming back to the M Pavilion uh, structure, why bamboo? It's easy, it's light, it's agile, it's robust. 
for me what's important is the phenomena the nature of it not so much the materiality of it but more the nature of how it allows us to be at a certain point it transforms and so while you know maybe intellectually academically you even know it that you are looking at bamboo but what you're experiencing is everything but that It's now my pleasure to introduce Craig Jeffries, Director of the Australia India Institute, Australia's only national institute dedicated to the research and analysis of India. Craig is a former professor of development geography at the University of Oxford, an official fellow of St. John's College, who in 2015 decided to move to Australia, to Melbourne, to lead the AIA as a director and as an, a u unique opportunity. Craig is the leading authority on South Asian youth and also writes on Indian democracy, educational transformation, globalization, and the social revolution that he sees occurring across India in the 21st century. Since his arrival as director of the Australia India Institute, Craig has obtained funding for 10 postdoctoral scholars. This new generation network will work on different aspects of contemporary India in different Australian cities and thus revitalize Indian studies in this country. Please join me in welcoming Craig Jeffries. Craig. Thank you, Don. May I begin by echoing Don's acknowledgement of country. Like Don, I pay my respects to the indigenous elders, past and present, and acknowledge the university's important relationship with the Wurundjeri elders, who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the university at Parkville stands. On behalf of the university, may I also acknowledge Naomi Milgram and the Naomi Milgram Foundation, whose important work has been integral and, and crucial in supporting the M Pavilion initiative. The M Pavilion has brought a succession of acclaimed architects and designers to Melbourne, including the speaker this evening, Bijoy Jane. As a university, we're inspired by the M Pavilion initiative because it creates opportunities for new collaborations, new ideas, new critical reflections on architecture and design. Today, of course, is an especially exciting day for this project. The day marks the release of the M Pavilion 2016 design by Bijoy Jane. And tonight's lecture is a superb and very welcome opportunity to hear from the designer in chief. So now for some words of introduction. Bijoy Jane, born in Mumbai, completed his architecture studies in the United States and then worked in professional practice in Los Angeles and London for a total of six years. He returned to India in 1995 where he founded Studio Mumbai, which we've just seen, which has become an internationally influential design practice with presentations at the 12th Venice Biennial and the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's also won many prizes, including the BSI Swiss Architectural Award and the 2009 Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. Studio Mumbai is noted for a professional ethic, which is highly respectful of place and of local practice. It fosters use of traditional skills and local building techniques and encourages a close relationship between land and architecture. In the words of one newspaper commentary at Studio Mumbai, Bijoy Jain has begun to create structures that deeply inhabit their environs rather than seizing space from a landscape. This evening, Bijoy will speak about some of the philosophy which has inspired him and his work with Studio Mumbai including local knowledge 
and traditions, or law, that's law, L-O-R-E, rather than law, L-A-W. Appropriately, then, the title of his talk is Architecture and Law. To deliver tonight's lecture, please welcome Bijoy J. Thank you, Craig, for the introduction. Thank you, Donald. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in Melbourne, and I'd like to thank Naomi Milgram, who's been very generous uh, with the invitation to have me here to participate and be part of the M Pavilion for 2016. So thank you, Naomi, for this very generous invitation. Thank you all for taking the time uh, and being here. And uh, for me, what, what I would like to share with you today is more a personal journey. Uh, what's important, I think, uh, for me here is that architecture really is more a means of expression. Uh, it's a way that I'm able to communicate uh, thoughts, ideas uh, that reside within me, but also with the environment that I inhabit. Uh, so again, very quickly, this idea of law, uh, a body of traditions and knowledge on a subject or held by a particular group, typically passed on from person to person by word of mouth. The second one I find interesting, the space between the eye and the base of the bill of a bird or between the eye and nostril of a snake. For me, what's important here is it's more about a sense an idea of an intuition. Uh, I'm very curious about this idea of a mythical being. I think all of us here gathered here are fundamentally mythical beings. And how do we tap into that resource of this idea of something that inhabits us sort of in a deep space, this idea of past, present, but also the potential future? And how do we in that process traverse these sort of boundaries, these infinite boundaries in space? Again, for me, architecture is sort of something that we sense, or the idea of space uh, comes from the idea of the five senses that inhabit us. You know, the sense of sound, touch, taste. Uh, they all become instrumental in the way that we understand uh, our immediate environment. I'm sharing a slide here with you. Uh, this, is, this is actually uh, in a mine out in Rajasthan. There was a flood, uh, and I often say that, you know, the idea of an aqueous foundation, that civilization is built on an aqueous foundation, one that's in <coughs> continuous flux uh, in, in, in a state of between the ebb and flow. Uh, this, the next slide, you know, it's quite interesting. Again, for me, just to sort of put things in perspective, I, I, I work in a country with a billion, 200 million people, uh, in a city that has 22 million people uh, that inhabit the space. Uh, and I think for me what's curious about India is, is not the, the sense, it's the sense of chaos, but not in a sort of negative way. Uh, this idea of you know, something that lies between a yes and a no. I'm sure if you've spoken to Indians or if you've been to India uh, and you ask a question, you'll kind of get this nod of this head. You know, and you ask, are you saying yes? And again, you get this head. <laughs> and this sort of idea of you know, between a yes and a no. Uh, you could ask the same question on a Monday and, and get a particular answer and ask the same question on a Wednesday and you'd get a completely different answer and they'd sort of look back and say, why did you not ask me this before? Uh, I think what I'm suggesting here, it's more about the idea of gesture and manner. Uh, for me, that's really what is being communicated, you know, the gesture of the body, the gesture of the speech, uh, the gesture of the hands. Uh, so these are sort of things that are, that, that are important for me. Again, we're at a sort of, you know, the economic growth in India in the last 20 or 25 years, it's a sort of a juggernaut. Uh, and for me, what's interesting is that I think if you're organized, you know, in a way that if we all in, 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 in my country had, you know, numbers or we were sort of specifically defined, we would implode as a culture. Uh, and this slide that I'm sharing with you on the left is quite interesting because uh, for me, the idea is that how do two parallel economies exist? Uh, again, one of the important things uh, that I'd like to share is that fundamentally, our sense of time 
is more connected to the idea of lunar time, this idea of the moon, the cycle of the, you know, the relationship between the sun and the moon. That's really how I understand civilization evolved. Uh, it's only very recent, you know, it's a few, four or five hundred years before Greenwich Mean Time was introduced. Of course, that is the operating system today, uh, but that's what in some way governs us. But fundamentally, we, I believe that we actually move between these two aspects of time. And so the slide on the right demonstrates uh, this is actually uh, sand that's being dredged in an estuary in, in a, 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 on, on the sort of mouth of a river. Uh, they can have these boats, they're fishermen, uh, and so this is a, another uh, occupation that they do when they're not fishing. The boats go out in, in the low tide. There's no machines, no motors, so licenses are not required. They dredge the sand, and in the high tide, then they bring that back in. Uh, and then you can see the trucks you know, up on the right there, which in some way, there's a sort of organization that begins to set up. So this idea of also the idea of civilization being built with this idea of an ebb and flow, and how that becomes instrumental in the construction, you know, of a city. Uh, so just these are sort of images that, that sort of inspire me, that sort of are motivations of, you know, why we do the things that we do. Uh, the slide here on the left, uh, this particular image. Again, this idea that which one came first, the ramp or the stairs? Uh, there's a motorcycle now that's uh, part of the household. Uh, and in the evening, it's brought into the living room as a sort of prize, prize place. It has a sort of important space in the living room. So the ramp has actually been introduced much later. For me, what's interesting is the ability to negotiate this space where you displace the sense of which one came first. You know, they both in some way coexist. Uh, the rock on the right, this is in Humpy. Uh, I'd just taken this picture so several years ago. Uh, and for me, what was interesting was, you know, Humpy as a place, it's an entire city that's just been built with one singular material, this whole idea of an economy of means, uh, path of least resistance, uh, of making things. I think for me, the interest comes from this idea of how do I conserve my energy, and by locating the sort of genus loci of, of, of a material, you know, have the ability to sort of open it, sort of like splitting an atom. But anyway, you see these sort of, you know, little holes or these sutures in the rock. Your wooden pegs are driven in, you know, water is poured on those wooden pegs, which I found out much later, and then the rock is split. Very simple device, and an entire civilization has been built in this manner. This slide I particularly like. This was in Rajasthan. I had taken this uh, because I was curious about these pitchforks, you know, perfect representation of the hand. Uh, again, for me, the hand is important, not so much in this idea of craft or, or the idea of making, but more importantly, what's transmitted through that. And I think, you know, all of us gathered here, the first thing that touched us, the first thing that the, the moment we took our first breath, you know, it was the hands that actually invited us into this world. And I think that connection is quite deep. So it's not so much about, you know, it's not so much about what the hand makes, but the manner of how it makes, what's transmitted in the process of making or the process of touch, I think is important. But anyway, this, this idea of the pitchfork, I was exchanging money with the gentleman on, on, on the right with the yellow T-shirt. You know, and it was quite odd because all his colleagues and cousins and uncles were dressed in the sort of more classic linen sort of cotton shirt. And I said, you know, how come uh, you're dressed in this yellow T-shirt? And uh, he goes to me that, you know, these salesmen, traveling salesmen, you know, things are changing now in the country. And they give these T-shirts away. So I couldn't really argue. It's a warm climate. The T-shirt works well. <laughs> and I exchanged the money. And the next thing I know is he sort of puts his hand into the t-shirt and I look at him and I say, how did you do that? So he says, well, I took it home, my wife cut it up, you know, sort of Lucio Fontana cut and lined it with a beautiful satin, pink satin pocket because he doesn't wear pants, it's a sort of linen, cotton linen cloth that's wrapped around so there are no pockets. Uh. For me what's interesting is a certain lack of prejudice. Uh, what seemingly seems as a closed space, you know, this constant idea of tradition being lost, uh, the nature of how we are, 
is changing based on economy, based on this sort of juggernaut. And for me, what I find interesting is this a lack of prejudice that enabled a potential of a third opportunity where both these aspects can coexist, you know, the, the label on the t-shirt and the pocket sort of both coexist. I think my interest lies in the confluence uh, of the possibility of these two. Uh, this particular slide uh, I call postures in architecture. And what's important for me here is more the space in between, the hands and the feet. It's a sort of completely, uh, it's a complete cycle. Uh, but again, importantly, it's this space here. It's this space here. It's that space. It's this space here. And I think what I want to share with you is this idea of an empathy. There's a relationship that is in communication, the idea of the maker and the material both communicating with each other. Uh, it's not saying that I'm averse to machines. I think it's just our, maybe our inability to travel or to move in an agile way at the speed a machine moves. And I think that's where I think there's that disconnection. So it's more a way of an empathy that we can develop even if we use machines. And it's just to sort of in some way become familiar with the speed at which things move. Uh, here it's about the intimacy. So quite interesting, I can narrate a story. This was, we were in Venice uh, and we had to do this black screeded floor. Uh, we had the Italian contractors who came with a can of paint and we said, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't think we can achieve uh, what we intend here. I was there with a colleague uh, and, and an apprentice of mine at that time. He was American and 10 carpenters. But we had to do a work of these masons. It was normally uh, the work, the floor was laid out by the, my masons. Uh, now, what was interesting was that they said, well, I think we can do it. Uh, because we've watched how they mix you know, the pigments and et cetera, et cetera, the materials. So I think the question that I'm asking here is that maybe the postures that we take, you know, uh, methods of making are possibly lost. And I say that because that's when the question sort of arose in me. Because uh, what it required was for us to sit like this down on our haunches and work the floor for about a couple of hours. I tried to go down on the floor 30 seconds and I was back up. Uh, Sam barely made it down to the floor. But the carpenters, you know, worked there, you know, continuously for two hours. And again, it was this idea of that intimacy. And they were actually able to work the floor. So just a question that what if the, in the postures that we take, and again, not just physical postures, but more metaphorical one also, that methods of making, methods of you know, tradition that we call are lost. For me, it's not really lost. Possibly they're obscured in time. I don't believe anything is lost. Um, this is an interesting video. I don't know how to. So this entire space has been handcuffed over a period of 50 years by four families using a chisel and hammer. Uh, and I just discovered this last year. It took me about six months before I knew something like this existed. Uh, and so this idea of connection to time, you know, in, in some way, a method of making that has existed for thousands of years, and they still do it, just two instruments, the chisel and the hammer. And what they do is they take the hammer and they tap the ground, they find a sort of particular sound uh, that reveals a sort of a fissure or a crack. Uh, they make these holes, you know, so there's what you saw is him making a hole, then another one is made, another one. And then they basically join the dots. And the moment they join the dots, the slab just pops out of the ground. 
So for me, what's interesting is the potential that you can actually do a full-scale line-out drawing, flat slab, flat packed, and in just this action alone, basically you get a tilt-up slab. Just the idea of you know the path of least resistance or the potential of an economy of means, you know. And so, what for me is interesting is that things like this, I believe, still exist. And and I know oftentimes I'm asked that you know this is sort of a romantic idea that it exists in India. But I do believe in some form or in some way it exists pretty much all over the world. Uh, again, that idea that's embedded in, in the idea of lore, there's a sort of storytelling, an aspect of continuity. Uh, this particular slide I shared, this is Ajanta Elora, which was, you know, goes back you know, several thousand years. But for me, what's interesting is how is a transfer that took place, because this entire project, so to speak, was built over a period of 500 years. Uh, so I'm just, I was just very curious, what must it have, what must have been, you know, for the first guys with the chisel and hammer, you know, going through the rock, it was just a rock, and it's a subtraction, basically reconstructing the idea of Mount Everest, just as a sort of symbolic gesture, uh, and a homage to that. Uh, so that's sort of interesting that what, what enables that transmission or transfer from one generation to the other. And I think somewhere, you know, in what we do, or the potential, that potential actually is there to transmit, to communicate uh, with another civilization that's being formed or in the process of being formed. Uh, this, I'm going to go into a few of the projects in some way to demonstrate uh, my curiosity of, of genus Loki. Uh, this is an excavation that we found on a site. It's a house for a multi-generation family. And in, sen in some way, this became the center of the project, the sort of belly button. Uh, the house is more like a, a colonnaded courtyard that in some way supports this central space. It involved the local community. There was a master well builder, the gentleman up there on, on, on the top, uh, who lost his you know, he, he broke his legs at the age of 20, he kind of fell in, but then spent the rest of his life really mastering this idea of, you know, building wells. But it's sort of a divinity, I think, that, that he was able to in some way overcome. Uh, so he was very particular in the sort of idea of the fissure and that we straddled it with an arch uh, so that over time gravity would not compress the soil and close that fissure, so it always allowed for that sweet water to be in close proximity to the ocean. Uh, so that's the community that's at work. Uh, that's a cross section, giving a sense of that being the central space, the belly button, and the house that's wrapped around it. And what's interesting for me here, this is a picture taken uh, during the monsoons. Uh, and there is a particular day, it happens every year, uh, a full moon, high tide, and heavy rain. Uh, and the water fills up all the way to the top. Right there, that's, and what you see, these are air vents or holes that allow for air, light, and water to sort of penetrate into the space. This slide here, and that's for me an interesting one here. Do you see the registration of this water line? This was a slide that showed the high tide. So this sweet water uh, sitting on top of salt water, and this, is this, this room is more like a vessel that's moving. It's a clock. Uh, and what I discovered, you know, in, in the idea of the senses, that we often uh, position ourselves, it's the view to the sea, you know, the distant horizon. Uh, but for me, what I discovered was the presence of the ocean with the lack of sight, because I think architecture fundamentally relies on, on the view, on the idea of the visual. And the other ones sort of, take, sort of take more of a background. They sort of recede into the background. Here it was quite interesting because in registering the water, the presence of the ocean was far greater or far stronger in, in, in the sense of feeling it. And again, it's like this idea of a conch shell that you, you know, hold up to the ear. You could hear this sort of reverberating sound. Uh, so for me, it was an active space. And this idea that the idea of sight, if sometimes being taken away, uh, that the presence of something is, is, is felt even in, in a sort of much stronger and a much sort of deeper way. So that's, that's the sort of, that's the belly button. Everything feeds and nourishes this belly button. Uh, and I say that because in time, uh, you know, the house will in, in time change. Uh, 
uh, going to, you know, if it's not looked after, families change, uh, it, it might dismantle itself. But what remains is in the core, this space for nourishment, the place for life. And then it can enable another possibility using this as a resource. So I think for me, the project really is the water well, really, more than the house itself. The house, the, the well, in some way, feeds life to the house. Gravity, the force that attracts a body towards the center of the Earth or towards any other physical body having mass. Uh, these are sort of important words that, that for me, are, are critical in the way that one shapes things, you know, just the influence. I think gravity is, is a sort of egalitarian force. We all sense it, we all feel it. Uh, it's a matter of how we negotiate uh, gravity and, 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 and uh, in some ways suggest a sense of lightness. So again, it's this constant negotiate, negotiation of this force. This is a project in, in Ahmedabad. Uh, again, what was important, it was a space that was in, inhabited by 40 or 50 wild peacocks. They'd been there for years. Uh, and what it meant was that if we had a lot of movement on the site, uh, it would possibly potentially drive these peacocks away. Uh, so the whole basis of the project was developed by actually with the idea that no trucks leave and no trucks come in. Uh, the foundation itself, uh, the excavation that was made, uh, the soil or the sand that came from that was used to produce the bricks of the house. They're sort of more like these plates. Uh, and it's again, these are three houses with a central courtyard, a multi-generation you know, multi family again. India has, you know, we still have this tradition of large families uh, that share, you know, uh, uh, the, the public space that remains common uh, to them. Uh, and so all the material basically came from the ground. So in some sense, the project, in a way, emerged out of the ground. Again, I brought gravity at the beginning because for me, What's important, every subsequent, subsequent monsoon, the house in some way gets pushed in, just carefully, just, you know, just slowly nudged in, where it then finally settles. And in that process, the trees, the landscape, all of that, you know, in the nurturing and in the caring of the house, the sort of the trees sort of provide an opposite force. And it's sort of, that's for me, this idea of you know, gravity, that there's an opposing force that in some way creates a sense of life to the, to the house or to the project. <coughs> Posture, the word comes from the Latin verb ponier, which means to put or place. To observe the concept implies an implicit understanding of the carriage of the body as a whole. To approach, attitude, or the positioning of the arms and legs in relation to the object which is being manipulated. Uh, this is suggested here with a project that was done up in the mountains. Uh, this is up in the Himalayas, 8,500 feet. Uh, and it was a, it was a travel lodge. Uh, visitors would go there and then travel and have village walks around the area. That's the plan. There are these four units, the main central unit, which is the living, dining, and the common space. Uh, what was important here was that it was land that was leased by the farmers, and it was very clear the farmers said that nothing concrete could be built here. It had to be transient. Uh, so what we did was actually you know, go to the site about four or five times and look at the proportions or the manner of the way they built it. It's dry stack stone masonry, but it was interesting, you know, the dimensions uh, or the proportions that, that the spans became important. So here's suggesting, you know, again, here it's being built as per the seasons, the sort of cycle of the monsoon, the winter, and the summer, because in the winter time they don't work. Uh, that's when they, you know, look after their uh, flock, the cattle, uh, and they spend time actually fixing or repairing the houses or building new, new houses. Uh, so this is the people involved in the work. Uh, again, 50% of the project uh, was built on site, you know, with materials that came barely from about 500 meters away. Uh, and then what we did was we actually carried the timber that you saw earlier from, from the plains. Uh, and it was a sort of joinery uh, system that, we, uh, that was proportioned on what a person could carry because there's no car or no 
uh, machine that can take you there. It's a sort of two-hour walk up into the mountains. So the whole proportion came with the idea of the carriage of the body and the positioning of these structures on the land. For me, this one, this slide is of particular importance because in that, this idea of lore, uh, this idea of foundation, this idea of impregnation uh, that exists. Of course, this is something that was fictional that we made up, but these walls are sort of remains of a settlement of some sort of, you know, organization of, of, of how the land was traversed, be it human or animals. Uh, and the idea that one can continually occupy it because it's a 10-year lease, they've extended it for another five, but the potential that that might then be dismantled and this continues to be absorbed by the landscape or the possibility that something else can be built upon. This is important, this is the introduction of the M Pavilion. Uh, for me, these are three aspects that are very important uh, in the making of architecture. For me, this is the material that actually makes, for me, architecture. It allows us to breathe. It's a perfect representation of an extension of the human body. Uh, so water, a colorless, transparent, odorless liquid, which forms the seas, lakes, rivers, and rain, and is the basis of the fluids of living organisms. The invisible gaseous substance surrounding the earth, a mixture mainly of oxygen and nitrogen. Light, the natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. So with, with the idea of the M Pavilion, it was quite interesting that my first day uh, at site, I remember walking onto site and for a moment I think it was more, I wouldn't say displaced, but a sense of being a little disoriented. Uh, and I sort of make this, uh, I show this more as a diagram, uh, for me this idea that there's a center and things are sort of moving around the center. Again, the idea of finding water. So, you know, as we were talking about it and in, in, in conversations about the location, the history of the site, and the sort of stratification of time, of, of civilization that, that, that sort of in some way inhabits the place. So for me, really the, the sort of single most important gesture with the M Pavilion is this idea of making a bore that goes straight down to the water table and in some way connecting to the first settlers of that land. Uh, again, the registration of something deep into the ground and the sky, this idea of, you know, sort of you'd seen the video where it's this sort of the spine, the cord that's stretched and this very perfect idea of an angle of repose where gravity is transferred seamlessly down deep into the ground. Uh, so that's the sort of first sketch. Again, the idea of why, you know, why a pavilion? So for me, the occasion for a pavilion is to celebrate uh, something, something very deeply embedded in its location. And I think just by that very simple gesture of making that bore and connecting to water, you pretty much connect to all the civilizations that have existed. I'm going to quickly read, uh, maybe through it, this is a writing uh, just sent to me by a friend just before coming into the lecture and I had it printed out because I thought it's very precise. Uh, and he goes on to say, I think in its essence the idea is to go back to the beginning of civilization and to the time when man wasn't necessarily individual but a group that nourished itself through individual contribution. This idea of mutual aid. The hole and water is the reason, an anchor to initiate the first settlement, and then all the different people and materials involved are somewhere forming this group where each one brings something to the collective shelter. Not just physically, but also emotional. Not very different from the idea of karseva, which means that, you know, self-help, when they build these temples beyond economy or even barter. In this way, the building of shelter becomes a living part of this group, changing constantly uh, in its physical and sensory existence, celebrating, pausing, decaying, shielding or brooding as per the group's engagement to it. That's what all the references we look at do for that matter. In this sense, I think the pavilion becomes congruous to its own references or even predates them. It becomes of another time. 
one that has always existed and one will continue to exist whether or not the contemporary culture acknowledges its presence. I'm just going to go to an important slide. Yeah. And for me, this is the part that's critical. That's the board. This is a model. There's an oculus, uh, and there's a deep board. This is about a six inch diameter, 150 centimeter board that's made. And then the, the part that comes out of the ground is covered in gold leaf. Uh, in some way, it also emits its own light. Uh, and the whole pavilion really is, in some way, Again, this idea of protection, this idea of containment. Uh, but in a way, uh, with the idea that sort of the gesture is, is uh, how do I say, it's, it's a very passive gesture. It's a roof uh, that we're making, which is made out of the red mud of Victoria, the red earth of Victoria uh, out here. And in some way, this idea that it actually collects all different cultures, all different civilizations, and all different geographies you know, on, underneath this sort of red earth roof, uh, which in some ways the interface between the ground and sky. These are sort of tests that we did in our studio uh, in some way to understand, again, it's, the entire building is in some way woven. It's, it's, it's sort of stitched, it's hand stitched. Uh, again, for me, it's important, not the idea of being organic, but this idea very similar, if it had to mimic the human body, this idea that it emerges from the ground and can then return back to the ground. So in that sense, the DNA is contained even in its transformation and its continual transformation. So these were all the tests. These were models that we were making. This is something I discovered, and it was quite unusual because I had just moved house after 20 years from my studio that was in Alibag, uh, and I had to quickly make a space uh, within two weeks, and these were actually forest dwellers who uh, live close by and adjacent to the property. Uh, and what I discovered the night that I slept in this roof that was, you know, covered with mud, it was just this, these sticks that they find in the forest and they're woven together uh, with a hemp, earlier with hemp. Uh, and then they apply, you know, it was applied with cow dung and mud as a binder. Uh, but what I discovered in the process having slept the first night, that when I woke up, I thought I had slept outside. There was no sense of actually being contained in an interior space. And for me, what was interesting in some way was the ground was lifted up, and in that space was contained air, light, and water, atmosphere, as we would call it. Uh, and that became the sort of inspiration uh, or the sort of instigator to make this sort of gesture here in Melbourne. Again, the idea of bamboo, it's supple, it has the quality of being bones, like the way that constructs a sort of skeleton, uh, tied together, uh, there's a sense of binding. Again, the idea of the hand that touches every part of, of the building, and for me that's important because this idea of embodied energy. And I know if we, if for me at least, if I stay in that practice, stay in that process of this constant sense of touch, and the transmission through that sense of touch, something is received or something is embodied in the building that in some way when we participate, it emanates. There's a communication that potentially will occur. Uh, at least that's my faith and belief and the endeavor is to continuously work in that idea. Quickly, the last project, this is three words that for me are important in the way that we make things or the way we do things. Affection, it is one's ability to observe and to identify with another situation or condition and to then care for it and protect it in the hope to provide it with what, if, what it needs to be to be itself. Restrain, to hold back from action, especially by force. Manner, from the French manière, substan devised use of the objective meaning done with one's hands, a notion which reveals a method of execution or a way of doing 
especially with the regards to the outward manifestation of an embodied process. Uh, for me, this very beautiful image of this young lady, just the gesture or the manner, the posture, uh, and she's actually making silk thread, and she uses her body in, and then rolls the thread. Uh, but for me, what's interesting is there's an anticipation of something that is to come. So she sort of became the inspiration. This is quickly the last project I'm going to show. It's a weaver studio uh, in, in the northern part of India. It's a Japanese lady who uh, you know, fundamentally farms the land. She grows her indigo. She has her own sericulture, so the silkworms are cared for. Uh, and then from that, she basically weaves textiles. So all the plants, all the trees, and the entire land is fundamentally nurtured. It's more like an idea of a way of life. This is the gesture. There's, there's the clients and some of the participants that we're actually drawing the house, just suggesting the potential of the space. Again, this idea of stratification. This is material that's found. It's, 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 uh, it's the riverbed. Uh, these rocks are what are used in the construction uh, industry out there. So all the materials that we built this project with come from maybe a 50 kilometer radius. Also a lot of the manpower comes from a very sort of close uh, periphery. Again the idea that a site in some way can reveal something that could have potentially been there. So I show this more like it's like a sense of an archaeology. Uh, there's a discovery uh, in, 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 in the idea of the excavation. For me, foundations are very important aspects of the building. It's not so much that you see them, but the fact that you can sense them, because what's above gives you a sense of what's below. That's the plan. Uh, again, here, what it, the, the whole idea is that it catches the moon uh, when it rises in the east, and so this, the gesture is... Actually, you know, it's, 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 it's this gesture which is capturing the moon inside the courtyard. This is the main space out here, which is the workshop space. That's the residence. Uh, this is the washing area, which is an extension of the workshop, the gallery space, you know, dining and eating facilities and sort of infrastructure. And that's really the sort of shape of the land. And the agriculture takes place here and all the way here. So it's sort of in some way enmeshed with the whole process of construction. I'm going to quickly run through this. I think I'm running out of time. But it's fundamentally made with lime, uh, with brick, with stone, and wood. Uh, it's a completely inert building. Uh, the idea also was that the idea of energy that is transmitted through these materials, have, they have their own filters. They have their own sort of, you know, it's like a sieve that, that collects the sort of energy that goes through them. Again, the idea that lime as a material, that this will endure time. As it gets older, it will only get better. Uh, that's pretty much how the civilizations that we know, be it Venice, uh, be it the European cities, you know, be it India, lime was really an important part that allows us to experience the things that we experience today. Uh, again, for me, it was important to demonstrate or the possibility that processes like this are still available to us, and in a certain way, they can uh, in some way compete or challenge other economies of building. Uh, so again, it was not so much out of nostalgia of returning to the past, but more the idea that it could be brought to be made present and a potential future. This is a structural test. You know, that was my client you know, standing on the stone slabs doing a structural test. Uh, bamboo uh, reinforcement, which is then lacquered uh, with the sort of black bitumen. And then that's covered in, 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 in with the stones and lime. So just this is the whole process of building. For me, what's interesting, it's four acres of land. And the entire land has been touched by hand more than once. That means every grain of sand, every grain of earth there has been touched by hand. And just that idea of the caress or affection, I think for me, that's important. The architecture, in some way, will embody that energy that's been put in. So it's all built in stone. Uh, so you see these are stone columns here. These are methods of building that are still prevalent. Uh, it's sort of like a, a timber joinery, but they actually do it with stone, like in Fatehpur Sikri.
And what's quite interesting is the relationship in this particular project. All the different parts that sort of were linked. You know, this is a Swiss line master who's present here, Rudy Krebs, a very close collaborator and a friend. Uh, and again, the idea of that gesture, you know, the, the manner of uh, the way that the material participates with what's being made. So there's actually someone, and you can see there's maybe two different ways that it's done. This is, you know, local from, from back home in West Bengal. And then there's a Japanese right there in the corner. There was this sort of conference of these three different plasterers and just in the difference in technique. But for me, what was important was the ethos or the sort of idea of how they participated with what was in front of them. And that's quite interesting. So this is a gallery space, and that's actually a marble roof. Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, it, it was interesting because marble, oddly enough, is less expensive than MDF or plywood. <laughs> you know, so it just made sense. Uh, that's the indigo fields. This is now the third year. So what was interesting was she started farming the day we made the excavations. So this idea of nurturing the land, or the idea of cultivating architecture, I think for me is very important. This idea that we cultivate, uh, and that civ this idea of civilization through the idea of cultivation. That's the indigo from the fields. Uh, the threads are actually drawn from cocoons that she has nurtured and grown. On, on this. So it's a kind of laboratory where it's sort of an engagement of a way of life, a way of making, uh, a way of participation, and how everything, and, and this idea of self reliance, that everything that one needs can be drawn from the land. Of course, what's important is how one participates with it. This is all lime. Uh, Rudy was very instrumental in. In, in, in the manner of the way that it was done. It was you know, techniques that have built Venice, uh, that have built Rome, uh, that have built many cities in India too. Uh, but it was interesting that you know, there was a transfer of technology, so to speak, from another place. That's the room where the indigo is, is, is nurtured. That's where the indigo is stored to ferment. And that's where they get the dyes. This, it, and so it's sort of, in a way, the sort of core of the project. Again, indigo is used to, to uh, finish you know, the furniture and the doors. That's the space. This is the gallery space on the inside. And for me, it was fascinating, you know, this idea of light that permeates through the marble. It sort of, in some way, distills the light. Light actually moves through a mineral. Uh, and the quality of that light, or the experience of that light, is very particular. And I think it was important for me just to be, have the potential to experience that, and the fact that it was so in inexpensive to use these kinds of materials. I share this video because for me, I think it's the most important. It's more the manner or the way we participate in the act of making that sort of embodies that, that gets carried forward in then what is being made. Uh, and I call this idea of movement towards the angle of repose.
the angle of maximum slope at which a heap or any loose solid material will remain in place without sliding. Thank you. The, the third incarnation of the M Pavilion will open to the public on the 5th of October through the designs of B. Joy Jang. I want to thank B. Joy for both being here, but also for his generosity of spirit and exchange in presenting us both the insights into the pavilion that's on its way to Melbourne, but also in terms of his own work. In line with that, and particularly in terms of this notion of exchange, I want to also thank the M Pavilion, the Wheeler Center, the Australia India Institute, the Melbourne School of Design, and the University of Melbourne, but also very much to thank Naomi Milgram of the Ma Naomi Milgram uh, Foundation and his patron to this. Because at the end of the day, I think what we saw here tonight and what we will see by October is really that act that B. Joy spoke about, which is about cultivating architecture. Not just designing it, not just making it, but cultivating it as a cultural practice and that exchange between India and Australia, between Studio Mumbai and Melbourne. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.